Behind me and beneath this hill lies the body of a man so resonant within history that ever since his burial here, an entire school makes a climb to the top twice a year to celebrate the start of something and the end of something. Teachers and pupils walk side by side year after year to remember a man who was a teacher, an academic, a scholar, a visionary and a founder, a founder of a school, a founder of Abbotsford. And I'm going to tell you why. The year is 1858 and Cecil Reddy is born in London, England, to his Scottish parents. Becoming an orphan at a fairly young age, he quickly found himself back in his heartland at a boarding school in Edinburgh. Now, his opinion on education had always been rationalised by a stark realisation that, well, he had no knowledge of his own self, his own being. His mind was a whirl in regards to philosophy, ethics and religion. Education should strive for unity, he said, for if it leaves the mind in chaos then it can hardly be recommended. Cecil built Abbott's home with this in mind, believing that he was the man up to the task of sculpting the boys he would teach into men capable of leading the country into a world where religion was being rapidly overtaken by science. And so, in 1889, Abbott's home became a reality. Set in the rural environment on the border between two counties, these woodlands and fields would become the perfect setting for Eddie's dream. Towns were, as he saw them, a dangerous moral atmosphere or an unwholesome physical experience, the ill effects of which were to be avoided. Now, of course, Cecil did not always inspire. Indeed, one particularly vicious critique of his work was that his educational ideology never approximated to a readily identifiable doctrine, but more to that of a philosophical flag of convenience that tenuously united a diverse group of thinkers and practitioners. Now, instead of the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic, Reddy built his school on the three H's, head, hands, and heart. By 1899, Abbott's own pupils had nearly quadrupled in number, but dark times were ahead. The school had always been an international one, and by 1914, the coming of the Great War saw pupils and teachers sitting not across the desks from each other, but across bloody trenches, shooting at their classmates and friends. Every year in early November, the school remembers men from both sides. The choir sings Foray's Requiem, and their names are read aloud. And Abbott's home lives on. But one day some pupils came across a man set to follow Reddy into educational history, Kurt Hahn, founder of Gordonstone and of the International Collective of Public Schools, whose ideas were heavily inspired by Cecil Reddy's own. Now uniforms come and go, but ultimately remain the same. Uncomfortable, restrictive, dull. Cecil wanted Abbott's Holmes uniform to, well, allow for the practical activities that he had in store for the boys. And so top hats, blazers, posh shoes, and high socks were abolished in favor of far more practical attire. Ever heard of the Duke of Edinburgh Award? Well, you've got Cecil Reddy to thank for that as well. John Hunt and Kurt Hahn were instrumental in setting up the challenge. Torture to some, and may well have never conceived of it had it not been for Reddy. Now time passes by, as do all things, and Abbott's home grew and grew, continuously keeping ahead of other schools and serving as a beacon of change, reform and rethinking in the educational sector. In 1969, headmaster David Snell made the move for co-education, and since then almost all public schools have followed suit, allowing the change for boys and girls to grow and learn together. Cecil's grave lies at the top of the school, surveying everything he has made. Remember those two trips I mentioned? the start and then the end. In October is Founders Day, where everybody associated with Abbott's home pays homage to their first leader, thus the start of something. And at the end of the school year in July, the trip is made to mark the end of the upper sixth time at Abbott's home. Jerusalem is sung, the headmaster gives his blessing and tears are shed. And thus is the celebration of the end of something. Now, Abbott's home is 125 years old. 
And the significance of this has not been lost on the current generation of Abbotsonians. Since its outset, nearly 40,000 students have walked these halls and fields, sung loud and clear the school hymn, Jerusalem, in chapel, crossed the rose yard, and many have climbed up the front of school staircase in a spate of rebellion. And through all the years, and all the changes, and all the headmasters, Abbot's home has sat resolute, an education for life. And upon the jumper of every child, from the five-year-olds entering junior school to the young adults preparing for their final exams, are the same words surrounding the Abbot's home star, the symbol of Dr. Eddy's dream. Between these ages, the words are emblazoned not only on their uniforms, but on their hearts, taking them forward into the world. Glad day, love and duty.